Hi there, Yoya from Sharp 11 Music here. Today we will be doing some Michael Brecker workout. So take your best tracking suits with you and your instrument and off we go. So there is a lot of Brecker riffing in this one terrific solo he played with Frank Zappa live in New York, which I recently transcribed. If you haven't seen it yet, you should really check it out. It's amazing. I don't know anything like it. It's like the best rock saxophone solo you'll ever hear. Intensity, great riffs, great lines, uh, the build up, the rhythmic shifts, um, the riffing overall, it's super, it's really great. For me it's probably the best rock saxophone solos, but I obviously don't know all rock saxophone solos ever, so if you have any that really come close to this one, surely let me know in the comment section below, I'd love to see them. But Brecker was king of this kind of playing so we will take a few of those riffs and make them into a little workout that you can take and when you're playing on vamps especially like this this is a g7 g sus 7 with a sus 4 in it vamp then you have always some good material to use like brecker had and he wasn't afraid of his what's now called breckerisms like those certain licks you can really identify michael brecker with so the first one we see and he uses it two or three times in the course of the solo which is a kind of a long solo i think over four minutes is a grouping of six notes six sixteen notes so you get a rhythmic shift from two over three and i won't play all those licks exactly like he played them because it's just ids and he just took the ids and modulated like accordingly how he felt on it so but the id is that's the original ID sounds really simple right um, which it is so so you can really see it's almost a rhythmic thing on your saxophone like how you press the keys you know you really try to put an emphasis on this D because that's always the beginning of the six note grouping of course this grouping in itself gives a rhythmic cross rhythm but what also helps of course is that this tune is in 7-4 so it shifts even more even if he keeps on playing that cross rhythm. And to give it even another dimension but this time melodically he kind of modulated not completely as you will see but that the first interval is just a half tone higher and then it's not exact it's more in the way of a g sharp minor pentatonic which is really cool to do a half tone higher minor pentatonic which sounds really cool outside on a g7 so that's a half tone higher minor pentatonic and that sounds like this <laughs> So that makes this line really awesome. I talked about a workout. What you could do is for next week, if you would just practice 10 or 15 minutes, I have three of Wrecker Lakes today for you. You could just start with this first one and do it very slow. <laughs> It almost sounds like a very beautiful classical piece if you just listen to that. But this fits really nice into this G7 sus because it really works around that sus for this C as a main note and then the D to the G, just this fourth interval, a fourth interval always makes it hip guys. If you want to do hip stuff, use fourths. So practice that, just slow and then you can gradually speed it up and then also incorporate this this G sharp penta half tone higher minor pentatonic and then you of course also when you go this half tone higher you have to put your eyes a little bit wider and then the audience knows like whoa there is something happening there so that was the first one off to the second one and Michael Brecker wouldn't be 
Michael Brecker without those false fingering crazy stuff he does. <laughs> So what you basically hear here is almost, when I transcribed it, it's kind of hard because you hear in pitches really C, D, C, D, C, D. I mean, that's what you hear, but it's obviously not just C, D on the norm normal fingerings. I cannot even play them smoothly perfect, but I mean, it's not that you hear, you hear C, D, but at the same time you hear more and you don't know what is happening. So here I wrote in the fingerings for what I think with those overtones that can also cause a C and a D. And if you mix them up in the right way, then it gives this C, D, C, D in pitches, but with different timbres between those Cs and Ds. Let me explain. Actually, it's a grouping of four and the second and the third one are the overtones. So you first play a D and then you finger a low C and you can keep the octave key down for the whole pattern here. So if you do well and you keep your air, you should practice your overtones, but it generally helps to blow a little bit louder because of the simple fact that most people just have a better airstream when they blow a little bit louder. That's what you want to go for. A even airstream is really important here, guys. So it helps blow a little bit louder. It also helps that, I mean, Michael Brecker was blowing quite loud here. So you get a free pass on this one. Then you should get the overtone of a high C, which is normally this C. Sounds a little bit more like a brass player, right? And then you go to the next overtone, which is, you will hear a D, but you finger a G with the octave key. That's what you hear then in overtone. It's a little bit higher than a regular D, but that's what makes it cool here, guys. Just those little shifts in intonation and in timbre is what makes you drive crazy when you hear it, right? I mean, it's awesome. And then you play a regular C and then we're back at the beginning of the four note pattern. So, slowly. So then you get there and, but do this first slowly. Take it one step at a time and just do it in the first days, five minutes or two minutes even. It's really important to also think that you're aiming your air higher here to get those clear overtones and then get your fingers in place. No rush guys, you really need to give your fingers first the right information. Do it slow, the speed will come by itself if you are able to do it well enough slow. So, and then he has a little bit of a little variation on it in the middle and that's Okay, so the thing is that it is kind of generally hard to write this rhythmically right down. So just take a look at this four note pattern and then the next pattern actually starts on a kind of weird place rhythmically on the third beat, the third triplet note, that normal D, that's the first note of this next little pattern. But just see it as one pattern down there as a grouping of another four notes. So first you play a regular D side D and then you play G, G flat, F chromatically, but you let those three last ones flip into the overtone. So we get. So that sounds cool, I think at least. And then if you combine them, then you're Michael Brecker, I guess. So.
that's something like what he was playing. I'm not trying to nail it here exactly how he played it, but just the general idea. And then the third one is actually a broader theme that I want to discuss here is just a try it ID, but then to move it outside and let me show you how it works. You'll see it at a few different places in the solo. Um, and the first one is actually playing 5, 3, 2, 1. That pattern in a major scale and that grouping of notes. So in G it is. And then you'll see that he also moves it a whole tone lower. So that's, so that's 5, 3, 2, 1 in F. And then it goes another whole tone lower, another whole tone lower, and you get the ID. This gives a real beautiful outside shape because you have a very clear pattern within the triad, which is actually the Coltrane pattern for on giant steps, right? But then reverse. Coltrane played one, two, three, five. Brecker plays five, three, two, one. And then he moves that pattern first on a G, then to a F, then to a E flat, D flat, B, A. So that's the whole tone scale there. So you can see that he uses it further in solo. One other place I really want to refer to is when he does it in the low octave. <laughs> It sounds really evil. I wrote in activate evil embouchure because it helps to tighten a little bit that embouchure to get the nasty sound. And also if you have a microphone, it helps to put your bell really directly into the dynamic microphone because it gives that proximity effect. Those low overtones get really projected even more when you go closer to a dynamic microphone. So I guess that's a little bit the combination of why it gave that cool sound here. It's actually quite simple what he does in terms of melodic content because it's just a try it on an F, but it's the way how he plays it. And then uh, also the F, how it fits. I mean, that really emphasizes this sus seven sound. It has the minor seven in it, the nine and that sus four. So, so that's it. You play a try it down and one or two times in between, he just goes one time back to the C instead of what I also like about this is that he then resolves the C to the B, which is kind of a sus resolving uh, sound on this G7. So that's, you know, that's one of those licks when I was listening and completely into this solo where I got really goosebumps and into it. And now I have it transcribed. It seems so easy in a way in terms of notes, but it's just really cool what he's doing there. So guys, I hope that's cool stuff you can go and work with. Uh, work it into your own routine. It really doesn't have to be long because it's really small samples of note groupings here. So the first was Sounds really classical, right? And then the second was And then the third one was so guys, that was it. If you want to sound like Brecker and you have a G vamp from now on, a G7 or a G7 says, it really doesn't matter if you are clear about your intentions, which Brecker is in this stance, by the way, because he uses a lot of different little IDs, uh, which I discuss in my analysis on Patreon, which you also can go to if you'd like. He uses like 
a D minor blues on it, but also a A minor blues on this G vamp and he uses all kinds of ways to go outside. And sometimes I even have the impression he's more thinking in D minor Dorian, which is also perfectly possible. It's just different ways to think. It's all the right notes. You, G Mixolydian is of course the same as the notes of D Dorian, but it just really has a different sound if you put it in that context as a reference to Dorian. So guys, I hope you liked it. Let me know what you think and let me know what you think about this Michael Brecker solo and his pop and rock, especially rock playing here with Frank Zappa. I also have to include Terry Bojo here, the drummer, he does great and the, the cohesion between him and Michael Brecker here is what really makes it and that's the same kind of cohesion which they later, not very much later, repeated on the very iconic heavy metal bebop album, you know that uh, yeah, all the solos are great, but the Some Skunk Funk solo is epic on that one too. And Terry Bojo and Michael Brecker, same protagonists, um, make that same thing happening there, really. So that was it, guys. I'm Jorgen Reiners from Sharp 11 Music. You can visit us on the Instagram account or leave a like or subscribe if you haven't and you like this kind of content coming out every week. We hope to see you again and bye for now.